Okay, let's get started. Afternoon session. So this this morning we looked at electronic lab notebooks. Uh, most of the applications were closed. If people were collaborating, they were collaborating inside of an enclosed space. Uh, we're going to have a couple of talks now on open notebook science, where when the people have a, an online notebook, it's available to everyone to see. So I'm going to talk about shining light on chemical properties with open notebook science and open strategies. So first question that I get usually when I talk to people about this is why are you interested in openness in chemistry? Aren't things good enough as they are? So I'm going to tell you a little story, right, to, to show you the way things are and how you might be able to make things a little bit more efficient if you have access to the notebooks. So this is an example that was actually, actually just last week. Uh, our collaborator, Andrew Lang, from Oral Roberts University, we have been uh, docking these dibenzyl acetone derivatives because we believe that they're all going to be very easy to make. And this is the top hit from a small virtual library that we sent. These are actually phenanthrene rings that are fit into the uh, Paclitaxel docking site. So we thought, you know, the reason we picked this small library is because it should be easy to make. And in principle, you would just basically, this is a reaction that's done with benzaldehyde and acetone in teaching labs all the time. So it should be fairly straightforward. Uh, and in fact, that top hit that we just saw docking is, is that. But there was also a dinaphthal derivative that uh, was in the top 10 of our, of our small library. And that one actually had been reported as being synthesized. So I'm going to go and explore something, and I'll come back to this, attempting to make this compound. So... The question is, what's the current standard for sufficient information in communicating organic chemistry in the, in the current model that has evolved over several, several hundred years? So by definition, right, all peer-reviewed uh, published documentation has been approved as sufficient by three people at least. The author presumably are motivated to communicate what they know. The editors are motivated to keep the, the reputation of their journal high. And the reviewers are asked to, to, to look and, and approve that basically this document has enough information to reproduce it. But they don't have to reproduce it. We actually have to go to allow to reproduce it. So they don't step through the same steps that, that we do. So I'm going to be showing little clips of this uh, reaction attempts explorer. So we have these electronic lab notebooks that are open, but then we also abstract information to make them machine readable so that we can do substructure searches and queries such as this. So here we're asking compound acetone uh, and all any aldol condensation reactions that we, uh, that we monitor. So Matt here is going to give a talk uh, right, right after me and give you more details about this. But this is the classic experiment of benzaldehyde and acetone with sodium hydroxide. And it actually proved to be surprisingly difficult to, re to reproduce this reaction as duplicated from lab manuals that have, you know, that presumably have been well tested. This is one of the ones that Matt tried to, to re reproduce. And this is an example of a failed experiment, didn't get any uh, yield. But because we kept the lab notebook, we, as was mentioned earlier this morning, we can go through and look at the log and see that, in fact, the reason that this didn't work is because we got two layers. There was too much water, and so the benzaldehyde actually couldn't dissolve in the mixture. Failed. Okay. Now, we have a successful experiment. So here, the main difference is that we're using ethanol water one-to-one, -one, some additional small differences. But essentially, we got a very uh, high yield for, for this one. And again, by clicking on it, you can see the log and, and all of that. But what I want to focus on here is just a part of that lab notebook, which is a Google spreadsheet that we use for reaction planning. So in this case, we want to stay inside of the environment of the Google spreadsheet to see if it's actually true that it was one-to-one, -one, to see if the concentrations that are reported. Basically, um, Using only the ChemSpider IDs, we can call up various uh, web services that I'll show you in a second, and we can pull up things like the density, we can pull up uh, the molecular weight, and so we can make sure that everything is adding up and making sense, and actually reflecting what the student reported in the written part of the lab notebook. Now the way that we actually do this, uh, as of the past year, is uh, we call these Google Apps Scripts, that uh, were developed by Rich Apodaca and Andrew Lang. And if you simply go, I'll, I'll give, if you go down to this link and you copy the reaction planning template, you automatically have all these drop downs. And you can simply, by clicking on a cell, I want 
you type in acetone, I want the molecular weight, and it will give it to you. And so basically you can populate these Google spreadsheets very easily like that, and then the, the number will just pop up. So this is actually the experimental melting point for dibenzyl acetone inside of the sheet. And what we typically do, <clears throat> I have a write-up about what works well and what doesn't work well. To After you run the web service, it's a good idea to convert it to a value so that you don't have 30 different services attempting to run and failing. So that's a little trick if you, if you want to use these. And then we can do other things inside of this large Google spreadsheet, like link to the NMR, which is in JCamp DX format. Uh, we, we're using ChemDoodle. Uh, it works extremely well for a nice little interface. You can upload a JCamp DX NMR file anywhere on the web, and we have a little web service that lets you visualize it interactively. And so you can investigate if that's, you know, compound is pure and, and, and everything else that you need. And again, I'm not going to repeat this about melting points, but from that sheet, it gave you an average melting point for a compound. When you click on it, it gives you all of the sources of that melting point information, including these in red, which are actually curated as being outliers for whatever reason. So, again, this is the opposite co concept of a trusted source. We give you all the information, tell you what we thought basically were outliers, but you can still decide to use all or any of the information you want. So, basically... This concept of working from within a Google spreadsheet is really very attractive for a student who's trying to plan a reaction, trying to determine the yield of a reaction, and just trying to debug things. And if you're interested in any of this, there's a resource page um, down here. And we also have a sheet that has a, a, a clear description of every service here. Uh, some of them allow ChemSpider IDs as inputs. Some of them allow common names. Some don't. So basically everything's here, and it gives you instructions as to how to use them. So I'm coming back to the original question of we want to make this compound because it, it may be, um, it, it got a high ranking for paclitaxel docking. And so one of the concerns when you look at this is if you look at the solubilities, these are predicted solubilities, but that, that doesn't matter at this point, you'll notice that ethanol water one-to-one -one is extremely low, 0.02 molar. So we have a problem because if you simply use the original conditions that I showed you earlier, right, that worked for, for benzaldehyde, which was one-to-one -one ethanol water, you couldn't get this compound to dissolve. And so we were thrilled to find that other people had actually made this compound and would tell us how they did it. And this is where it gets interesting. So we also link to papers in our um, Reaction Explorer. The, the re reaction attempts database so that we can easily compare things. The goal here isn't to archive all the literature. It's basically if we did a reaction, we kind of want to see the papers that are out there that also tried to make this compound. So in this case, we have a 96 paper, and they did make that compound. They refer to an organic synthesis paper. If you're familiar with organic synthesis, right, it's probably the most validated source of organic chemistry reactions out there. I think it has to be triple uh, checked. It has to be actually redone by three chemists. The problem is, is that they just pointed to the one with benzaldehyde, and they just basically said, we did it like them. But how did you dissolve it? That's what I wanted to know, and there's no, there's no um, information. <laughs> Similar thing here. Um, they added, uh, they, they saturated the ethanol with the aldehyde, and then added it to a one-to-one -one water ethanol mixture. Again, if you're saturated, what's going to happen when it sees water? It's going to come out. So how did you deal with it? We didn't see it. Matt's going to talk more detail about these things. This is just, just sort of skimming through it. Another one, uh, tantalizingly close. Uh, they Here, they did not use water. They used 30 grams of sodium hydroxide in an unknown amount of ethanol. And that might sound trivial, but it isn't because the rate of the reaction is going to be highly dependent on the concentration. And they didn't give a yield, and they also didn't give an NMR. They just gave a melting point. So it's really difficult to try to get information to actually go to the lab and, and apply this stuff. If we had access to the lab notebooks, of course, we could see all the, the, the stuff that failed even, and we could, we could leverage that. So it turns out, as Matt will, will show, he got this reaction to work uh, very nicely by adding huge excess of sodium hydroxide in the water. Okay, so that's basically just one example of openness. If you have an open lab notebook, it's, it's actually beneficial for, for you, for your group, for you to communicate the science that, that you're doing.
Now, here's another kind of openness, which is not necessarily tied to an actual lab notebook. It's this open chemical property matrix. And I give you as a starting example, if you have log P, for example, and you look at the definition of what that is, right? it's basically you have water that's saturated with one octanol, presumably in contact with one octanol saturated with water, and that ratio will be, taking the log of that ratio will be the log P. So what do we do when we want to determine a log P? Actually, few people do saturate uh, water with one octanol, right? They basically assume that it's going to be the same if you just use pure water or if you use pure one octanol. And there is literature to show that you can do that in many cases, and there are papers that will show you can do that. There are also papers that show that you can take the absolute solubility in water, absolute solubility in octanol, not have them mix, and derive a log P, right, or work backwards. And in fact, what we're finding out is that when we go to databases that have, for example, aqueous solubility, uh, it's not necessarily aqueous solubility. They may actually have started with a log P they got from who knows and are giving you water solubility. So you have to be very careful what you assume. So basically, there is this matrix out there, and if you expand it, right, it turns out that all of these different properties, and there are, in fact, an infinite number of properties because you have continuous variables like temperature, right? So uh, even the log P changes to some extent with temperature in, in, in some cases. So there is this matrix out there, and what chemists have to do is find the closest thing to what it is that they're looking for to try to use that, that property. So... In this matrix, you want to think about three fundamental types of elements, right? You've got true measurements. So these are basically from open data collections. Um, like, for example, we have an open melting point data set of 27,000 melting points. That would, those would be considered true measurements, even if you don't have access to the lab notebook. Then you have calculatable descriptors. So these would be uh, from open source software like the CDK, possibly MOPAC 7.1, where you have the polar surface area. So that's a calculable number. It's a guarantee that you'll be able to calculate that number. Our requirements is that we, it has to be open. We have to be able to take it in and then spit it out as, as open data. That's why we can't just use any uh, commercial package. And then the third type is predicted properties, which are actually uh, values that are based on models that are based on this open data. And that's what we've done. For example, we have a, a melting point model, which I won't have time to talk about today. But that's essentially what we've done is we've taken all of the, the CDK and all these various descriptors and measurements and then made a prediction. Now, this, this concept of property is very interesting because ask a very simple question. I'm going to show you a recrystallization app in a, in a couple of minutes. And one of the things we want to know is what the solubility of benzoic acid in boiling benzene so it's actually really, really hard to find this information, by the way, but we did find a paper where they have temperature, and there's something really disturbing about this table, right? Yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of problems with this. And it's actually, and again, if you read the paper, there's really not that much information. They said they put a cork in a bottle, this is from 1924, put a cork in a bottle, put some benzene, put it in glycerol. I don't know. I mean, so basically, if you look at these numbers, they're clearly answering a question, but I don't know what the question is, right? So in order to know what the question is, I'd have to look at their specific equipment to see, did you measure the pressure? Because that's cool if you've got 100 degrees benzene under pressure. But then can I assume that your 80 degree measurement was the same as what I want to use it for, which is to boil it at one atmosphere? So a lot of these seem like very, very simple questions, but actually when you try to answer them, they're not. Um, so examples of these relationships. These are some of the formula that are of interest to us, but of course there's an enormous number of them out there where you're predicting, for example, the solubility like the log S based on melting point and log P. That's an interesting correlation. We found that in, in a paper that predicts aqueous solubility. Flash points, we have two different models that predict flash points. So all of these things together add up, and what we're doing now is actually collecting these, and our objective is to start to compare these to, to determine a couple of things. For one thing, um, these, these formula may have worked for a specific application in that paper, but how general are they with respect to the larger chemical space?
we can look at, for example, cinnamic acid uh, flashpoint. So alpha acer has a value for that, 166. So if you have a collection of flashpoints that are all from alpha acer, how good are those numbers? I don't know. They're probably okay, but we don't know until we actually run a whole bunch of these. But you can see this, these various formula, you know, predict uh, flashpoints varying um, extremes. And again, it doesn't mean they're bad. They're bad. It's just they might not be operating in the right chemical space. All right. So we look at solubility calculations. I showed you a couple of equations earlier. Cinnamic acid solubility in water. So we have an experimental and then two predicted. So the first thing when I look at this is how do I know that that number 0 0.0037 is actually closer to the truth? Maybe the 0 0.056 is a better formula than is this measurement. And again, this is why it's so important to abandon this trusted source model. You click on the link to find out how reliable that number is. It turns out there's actually 10 values that are all very, very close to 0 0.0037. So probably it's the model that is coming up short. And so that's part of the, the challenge here is to figure out, you know, if you're evaluating these equations to evaluate what your training set is, and how reliable it is. So with, with melting points, for example, we created a collection of 4,200 double validated melting points. So that means that there were at least two values that were within five degrees out of the 27,000 that we had. And so we decided to use that, but you know, other people can make different decisions. So practical applications for this. Okay, so first of all, what I was roughly talking about, the automatic open evaluation of models from the dark literature. So this is what's cool about this. You don't need to convince anyone to do open chemistry. You just have to go to a paper, pull out an equation, shine light on it, and then expose it to the open data that you already have, that you're already collecting. So it'd be neat to find out actually where they do work and where, where they don't in, in the larger chemical space. Uh, second, development of new open models built upon the population of new measurements, descriptors, and predictions. So our melting point model kind of fits that. And third is a new application, the identification of compounds with desired properties from virtual libraries. So what do I mean by that? Um, an example would be finding a good recrystallization solvent. So what do you need to do to, to come up with one? So basically it's just a stepwise process. You need to estimate or look up the solubility at boiling. So how do you do that? It turns out you really can't look up these values except for some extremely common compounds like benzoic acid. And even there, I showed you that there was problems with that. So you pretty much have to estimate these, which means that you need to be able to estimate the melting point. You need to put all this stuff together. But basically, you step through a series of these steps, and you can come up with, as long as you, these steps are actually properly evaluating, you should be able to come up with a good solvent. So what we needed to do is basically translate these into mathematical steps that, that we finally can perform, have all the pieces for now. So we can look up the solvent boiling point, we can look up the room temperature solubility, or predicted using Abraham descriptors. So again, that's a whole other talk, but Ab Abraham descriptors are a really good model for predicting solubility in a collection of almost about 90 solvents. And it actually works pretty well. And just recently, um, Andy Lang has shown that we can predict these descriptors fairly well, well enough to basically get useful information like this. So you basically step through all these. We use the CDK to predict the melting point. So we try to, to use everything to, to keep this, this open. And then finally pr predict a uh, recrystallization yield. So of course, if you're trying to get a solvent to recrystallize some material, you shouldn't care about any of that. You should basically just go to this app and type in under the recrystallization solvent. So you can type in a chem spider ID, a smiles, or a common name. They should all resolve. And it defaults to certain conditions that you can change. So minimum solvent boiling point 60. You don't want something like methylene chloride that's really hard to, to handle. Maximum solvent boiling point 80 because you want to dry off your, your precipitate. Uh, and then you can filter by minimum percent yield, and you can filter by the endpoint temperature. So, for example, if you're not getting anything at 25, you might go down to zero, which is another convenient temperature. So, we're actually getting some really interesting results from this app. So, for benzoic acid, you're getting two kinds of, of results. We're getting a lot of ethanol water mixtures, 
The reason for that is because the solubility is actually going to be low. And that may actually mean that the absolute solubility is going to be low at boiling as well. So the last little um, filter that we're going to put in is a minimum solubility at boiling so that, you know, like half a molar sounds pretty reasonable so that you don't use tons of, of solvent to, to recrystallize your stuff. So if you get rid of these water containing ones, carbon tetrachloride is one that we hadn't seen used in the literature and is actually really quite a good recrystallization solvent that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise. So we've been systematically comparing for cinnamic acid, benzoic acid, uh, and a couple, a couple of other compounds, the app, based on all of these, these open models, with actual recrystallization yields, and it, they're, they're coming out very, very well. So this is something that, if you want to try it out, let us know how it works. And we could also do the same thing. Uh, that app also has melting points. It has log P data. It has a, a, a couple of things that Andy's actually put in there. So going forward, where are we going with this? Well, that example of coming up with a recrystallization solvent is really just a general paradigm for asking what are the properties that I am looking for. Uh, in the case of the, these dibenzyl acetone derivatives, it turns out they're useful for a whole bunch of things, like malaria, skin whitening, antibacterial, different cancers, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. These already exist in the literature. And so if there is, for example, a known docking site, we can add that as one of desirable properties and work backwards. Or if there's a QSAR study um, that you know favors certain properties, we can put them in to any virtual library in this in this model and then work backwards. So even if there isn't a solubility and an, an aqueous solubility, we should have all the equations in order to calculate the missing components to work backwards and, and you know, tell us which, which molecules are useful to make. So uh, what I wanted to show you is basically that more openness in chemistry can make science more efficient, not just for people reading it, but also people generating the information because they get feedback. And also another important thing, I think, is provide interfaces that make sense to the end users. So everything that I've discussed is open. The, uh, the software, the models, the data, but the organic chemist doesn't want to see that, nor should they, right? So you keep that open, you make that accessible, but create apps, create, you know, and by the way, this, this works on smartphones, but it'll work on your laptop just as well. I'm just calling it an app because it, it, it does work fairly well on uh, smartphones. Uh, the Google Apps Scripts is another one, right? When you click Get Me the Melting Point, you don't have to know how it works. You can, but you don't have to know how it works. So really, that's, that's sort of the message I wanted today is, is to say that you've you got to take time, develop different channels to deliver the, your content so that it makes sense to your end users. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Andy Lamb, of course, all of the code here and the modeling. He wrote Bill Cree. Uh, he co-developed the Abraham model, so he goes way back, good guy. He's, he, he actually contributed an enormous amount of solubility data. He went back to his old lab notebooks for 20 years and found all the solubility data and stuck it in our open database. So really very nice contribution from him. And uh, Tony Williams, of course, ChemSpider service is critical for all this to work. And uh, Matthew McBride will, will speak next. He's been working with Rita Atif over the summer to do the recrystallization and syntheses that I, I spoke about here earlier. Thank you. Two minutes.